Welcome into the Beef Efficiency Conference. We'll get started here in a few minutes. Welcome into the Beef Efficiency Conference. We'll get started here in a few minutes. Welcome into the 2021 Beef Efficiency Conference held in conjunction with the Virtual Kentucky Cattlemen's Association Convention. My name is Becky Thompson and I work with the Kentucky Cattlemen's Association. While we are disappointed that we're not together in person in Owensboro this week, we are excited to bring you some fantastic speakers and a great program with some wonderful information this evening. I encourage you to visit the Kentucky Cattlemen's Association website www.kycattle.org to register for our upcoming Forages Conference tomorrow evening and our business conferences on Friday afternoon. We will be recording tonight's session and we will be posting uh, the videos of our speakers presentations later on this week on our Cattlemen's Association website. I know we have several University of Kentucky Extension agents with us this evening if you will please put your name and county into the chat box, we will make sure that this gets shared so you receive your in-service training credit hours. Please make sure to stick around to the end of each session this week. We will be drawing for a chance to win $100. Don't leave too early tonight because we will be drawing a $100 winner this evening as well. Before we, wanna, before we get started, I just wanna thank our 2021 convention sponsors for their support. We will be hearing from several of them this evening through commercials in between our presenters. This year, the Beef Efficiency Committee has put together a great discussion for you around the theme, designing beef production programs for the consumers. Now I would like to turn it over to our moderators, Dr. Gordon Jones and Dr. Jeff Lingkuhler for a brief welcome and some housekeeping tips for this evening. Dr. Jones. Oh, you're muted. There you go. 
Welcome everyone to our 2020 Beef Efficiency Conference. We wish we could be having a live event. I know you all wish that too, but this does give us the opportunity to welcome some guests that who maybe could not attend a live event. So we're going to try to make the best of this. I wanna give you a little bit of history of this event. And before I do that, I wanna thank Becky and her staff at KBN and at the KCA our staff at the Kentucky Beef Network and the Kentucky Cattlemen Association could uh, have done a wonderful job as they always do. And we thank you for putting together this outstanding event. I'd also like to thank Jeff Limcooler for his leadership over the years. Jeff serves as our committee chairman. And Jeff, I simply want to thank you for your outstanding work in involving our committee members in planning these events and conducting these events. And we look forward to doing those again. Now I wanna share a little bit of the story as to how I got involved in this. I spent 40 years full time at West Kentucky University as an animal science professor. And after I retired or as I was retiring, several people suggested they'd like to put some money into a scholarship fund. We had just had a major gift to the scholarship fund and really did not need additional scholarship fund. I did not think at that time, but I felt a little bit remiss in part of my career I felt like I probably had not encouraged students to be as engaged in lifelong learning as maybe they should have been. After we get a college education, we've just begun to learn and we need to continue learning. So I thought it best to put some funds into a lectureship to provide a really good program once a year for students or for former students or anyone else in the cattle industry to be engaged in lifelong learning. Dr. Limcooter, wrote a grant and got a, got a grant from the Ag Development Board to start a Beef and Fishery Conference in 2013. That same year we had our first one of our lectureships and we did that for two years. And then we decided we'd just combine those events. And since that time, that's what we've done. So we're really pleased to be involved in doing this. We wanna welcome all of you to this event tonight and we hope you can gain from this. And I would also say that our first uh, seven events generally were events planned to improve production management on cattle farms. And we think we kind of accomplished our purposes, but we thought it was time to maybe change our focus a little bit. So tonight's program is really about convincing cattle farmers and getting you to think a little bit differently than being cattle farmers. We're really beef producers or food producers. So the program tonight will relate to the fact that in this industry, we're involved in producing a very important food product for consumers. And now I'll turn, the, turn this over to Dr. Limcooter to give a little, some instructors about how we'll handle the questions, that kind of thing. Jeff. Thank you, Dr. Jones. And again, on behalf of the Beef Efficiency uh, Committee, I'd like to welcome everybody uh, this evening and I would also like to extend my appreciation to uh, Dr. Jones and, and Susan for their sponsorship for the uh, uh, program. It, it really does allow us to bring top-notch uh, speakers to you from across the United States. And without their support and, and the previous funds that we received through the um, KDF funds, uh, we wouldn't have been able to do that without charging a hefty fee. And so we appreciate that. And then also uh, we wanna thank KCA uh, KCA stepped up right away and, and offered to have our program in conjunction with them to help us reduce overhead costs and facilities. And so I uh, just want to thank KCA for their continued support as well. Um, as we go on this evening, um, you'll have the opportunity at any point in time to enter questions for our speakers using the Q&A. And Becky, could you cue that for me? We're going to show you... Um, the opportunity here that you'll have. So questions for our speakers should be submitted by using the Q&A. Um, some of you that are using a phone or an iPad, you may have to touch your screen. And once you touch your screen, uh, generally at the bottom, you'll see um, a Q&A box and you can click on the Q&A box and then begin typing in your question. Um, we will also, in the event that you hit chat mistakenly, don't worry, uh, we'll, we'll check those as well. Um, but I believe we've turned um, um, the raise the hand feature off and, and some of those features. So 
Uh, just be sure to use the submit uh, a question you do in the Q&A, but if you hit the chat, don't worry, we'll, we'll surely read those off to uh, get those answered as well. Additionally, in the event that um, we don't get your questions answered this evening, uh, we will follow up with those and uh, we'll, we'll try to either post those on uh, KCA's uh, website where the materials here will be, um, or we'll send out a, an email blast through the KCA office with questions and answers for those as well. Uh, again, thank you all. And at this time, I'd also like to um, thank our platinum and gold sponsors and, and really appreciate all the financial support that they provided. Many of you probably don't realize this, but when we go to these webinar-based meeting platforms, they do come with an expense, technology is not free. And so we want to thank our platinum and gold sponsors for their sponsorships. And at this point in time, let's hear a little bit uh, from some of our uh, gold and platinum sponsors by viewing uh, some of their materials. Becky? Red Hill Farms, the home of Practical Genetics, will host our More Than a Bull sale on Saturday, March 20th, featuring 70 Red Angus, Sam Angus, and Charlay Bulls. We provide our customers a full-service genetic program, more than just a bull. Follow us on Facebook, visit our website, or contact us to learn how we can help you improve your profitability in the beef business. What an accomplishment that we're all here today. We've learned about technology. We've faced many challenges over the last 18 months, but here we are doing the business of KCA. Dave and crew, uh, kudos to you for the job you've done of being flexible. We're so proud to be a part of this continuing effort to represent the cattlemen and cattlewomen of the state of Kentucky and, and to continue uh, running the best uh, producer organization that there is in the United States. Bluegrass is excited to be a part. We're excited about the future. We've initiated new tagging programs to help us do a better job of telling your story when your calves hit the market. Ask our reps about those. We'd love to visit with you. Uh, we look forward and we're, we're confident that we're headed into better times in the cattle industry. And uh, we, we look forward to being your partner moving forward to take advantage of that time when the leverage shifts back to the cow calf and backgrounder uh, and away from the packers. Uh, with that said, uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for letting us uh, continue to be a part of supporting this convention, these meetings. We look forward to partnering with you in the future. Thank you. When a producer uses our mineral program, whether it be our, our breeding mineral conceptate or one of the other lines of mineral that we offer, they're all powered by Amifirm. When Amifirm is present, it helps that cow take the forage that she's on break it down better and utilize it better and absorb more of those nutrients to our system. That enables her to maintain a better body condition score. And we know that better body condition scores are directly related to getting cows bred back, maintaining pregnancies, having healthier calves that weigh off heavier. Well, again, we certainly want to thank our sponsorships uh, and uh, we'll have more um, uh, words from them as we go through the evening. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, all of our county extension agents that have joined us this evening, if you would just type your name and county into the chat box, we'll be sure to uh, uh, put those names forward for your in-service training credits. It's my pleasure this evening to introduce uh, Sean Darcy. Uh, Sean joins us from uh, NCBA this evening, and Sean is the Senior Director of Market Research at uh, NCBA. Uh, the market research team really kind of has the role of, of helping enhance a, a range of uh, beef checkoff funded work, and I think that's one of the things that uh, you'll learn a little bit this evening about how your checkoff funds are being used uh, to enhance product development, product marketing, and also one of the things we don't like to maybe think about or we don't spend enough time thinking about is trying to work with our consumers and bring insight uh, to consumers uh, when we're thinking about um, or, or getting feedback from consumers when we're thinking about some of the management issues that we're dealing with and some of the production and nutrition as well as the uh, communication efforts that uh, we as cattlemen and the cattle industry need to be thinking about to help better communicate what we do to our consumers. 
Sean has over 11 years of market research experience. He's conducted hundreds of consumer uh, studies in his career. Uh, his topics that he's worked with have ranged from consumer perceptions regarding how food is raised, consumer segmentation, uh, food preferences, food service and retail trends, new product opportunities, advertising evaluation, messaging and brand insights. Prior to NCBA, Sean worked uh, for Comscore ARS, where he was an account manager of market research on the company's top pharmaceutical and consumer packaged good accounts. And prior to that, he um, spent some time as an assistant store manager here close, uh, working with Kroger's in the Cincinnati division. So he understands our region uh, and, and knows a little bit about some of the consumers in our area as well. Uh, he received his BA from the University of Northern Colorado there at Greeley. And uh, Sean loves being uh, at home in Colorado and uh, he enjoys spending time with his family. His wife and he have two children. Sean, on behalf of the Beef Efficiency uh, Conference Committee, we'd like to welcome you this evening and look forward to your presentation. Thank you, happy to be here. Becky, if we can go ahead and start Sean's presentation. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Sean Darcy, the Senior Director of Market Research at the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. We're excited to be here at the Kentucky Cattlemen's Association Convention this year. Hopefully everyone's 2021 is starting off maybe a little bit better than 2020 went. Uh, we're excited again to be part of this session. Yes, we do wish we could be there in person, but I think we have some great insights that might help set up uh, some of this convention and mostly in the minds of consumers. And that's what we're focused on on the market research team here. You know, what if they say they need and they want? So we'll just go ahead and jump into some of this data. We want to do an overview of just generally what we are hearing from the consumers. And then we'll make a shift into more production related market research and what we've seen lately in that area, specifically around beef quality assurance and the beef checkoff launched a program along the, uh, along these lines last fall. I think we can use this as a great success story on how we can set up future production stories with the consumer and help educate consumers on that topic. And then of course, we'd be remiss if we did not address what we're seeing with data and with the consumer during COVID this last year and, uh, and how that may change going forward and what you should expect from the beef checkoff. So just jumping into the consumer landscape, we run a consumer beef tracker here at National Cabinet's Beef Association. And again, that is run on behalf of the beef checkoff. And one of those, it's an attitude and usage tracker. 500 consumers a month come in that we balance the census. So we get about 1,500 a quarter and it's continuous. So it's always coming in. And what you're seeing here is weekly or more consumption. And so for this year, it's 72% of consumers are saying they eat beef weekly or more. You can see chicken on this scale at 82%. There's a drop off to pork and fish. And then we have meat alternatives. And I would say that this is more than just your impossible or beyond burger. You do see things like tofu getting lumped into this conversation. But about 30% of consumers saying they're having that about weekly or so. How about overall perceptions? I think it's just important to note on this slide Overall, when we ask consumers, are you positive or negative about beef? 70% say they're positive. So they're not coming from a negative perspective. I think a lot of times that sliver that you see that's 11% can make up or have a little bit more noise so they get a little more attention. And then looking over on the right, you compare that to chicken and you do see that that is above where beef is at 81%. A lot of those factors historically that have driven chicken above beef are things like value and health and so on. This slide is showing you consideration. So we ask consumers, how, how much do you consider the following attributes when you're making a meal at home? And what you are seeing are results in the yellow bar in 2018, followed all the way to purple in 2020. And these are some of those top attributes that are always or often considered when making a meal choice. So you have things like great tasting, is a good value for your money, uh, good for many types of meals, is safe to eat, nutritious, healthy choice really haven't moved much. You do see a little bit for safety being more considered as things have gone on, but you don't see much drastic variance here in the scores. However, when you look at consideration on production related ideas and you go back to 2018, you'll see a noticeable significant increase since 2018 on a variety of these attributes is raised responsibly, environmentally friendly, 
supports causes that are important to me, trusting the people that raise the animals. Now, these levels, if you go back to this slide, are not nearly to the levels of the 80% that we see with taste and value and um, the convenience factors, but they are growing, and it's important to be part of that conversation. Another thing we ask consumers are, do you plan to eat more, less, or about the same amount of beef? First thing I'd notice in the top right, nearly two-thirds of people are going to continue to eat the same amount of beef, which they're eating it at a good amount. So that's something to be, that's something that is important. If we look at those reasons they're eating more, you can see taste being that number one reason, grilling more often, beef is quick, quick and easy to prepare, beef has become a family favorite. I've actually seen a slight uptick in those during COVID, and we'll jump in more in that. Reasons to eat less beef. So 15% of people said they're going to eat less beef in the future. Now, these are aspirational numbers. Give you uh, some context behind that. Like we ask people this question in seafood, people are going to eat more seafood than they have for the last 10 years or so, but that number hasn't continued to grow. For the most part, they are health-related factors that are driving this conversation. We do see price also coming in there. You do see the environment. About 3.7% of people are saying they are eating less beef because of the environment and the similar number for people eating plant-based. Now diving into concerns, you know, we realize if we give a list to consumers and ask them what they're concerned about, they're going to choose a variety of things. So the one metric we track is concern, specifically unaided concerns where they fill in the blank. And we just ask them what, if anything, about how cattle are raised are you concerned about? About 56% of people give us some sort of concern. Most of that is pretty general in nature. You can see about 32% that focuses on your animal welfare, but there's not one other specific topic that hits above 10% worth mentioning at a high level. And these numbers have actually been like that even before this tracker in our previous tracking system back in 2014 and 2015. So these numbers really haven't gone up much. Most of that top of mind reaction is going to animal welfare. And another thing that's really important to remember is consumers are further away from their food than they've ever been. You know, on the left part of here, we have 27% of consumers are saying that they're familiar with how cattle are raised. And again, we're not testing them on their actual familiarity. We're just asking them, are you familiar? And still only 27% of people are willing to admit that they are familiar with that process. But at the same time, people are considering how their food is raised and grown more than they used to. So 44% are often or always considering that. Another 26% are saying they sometimes consider how their food is raised and grown. So it's becoming part of the conversation. And it's really important for us as the checkoff and other entities to make sure we understand that, but also make sure we understand where those concerns are like animal welfare and that consumers are coming from a level of not being knowledgeable. So we need to educate just how cattle are raised before we can talk about topics like the environment and antibiotics, because it would go right over most of our consumers' heads. We wanted to use this case study, Consumers and Beef Quality Assurance, to help you give a picture of what consumers think about beef production when we get a little bit more detailed. So we went out and we did focus groups in three different cities, Seattle, Philadelphia, and Denver, and then we quantified our findings in a larger quantitative analysis with over 30 or 1,000 consumers, excuse me. One of the biggest findings that came out, and we already showed you the lack of familiarity, but we did this exercise, and in the focus groups, it was actually pretty eye-opening. The moderator asked, you know, what have you, from cow to burger, from pasture to plate, what happened? And we recruited people that said they were interested and knowledgeable about beef production in these focus groups, and people just gave us blank stares. And the same thing happened when we asked them to describe it in this quantitative assessment. People just told us, I don't know. I don't know how cattle are raised. And if they did try to tell us, they were usually wrong or it was based on misperceptions. Another scenario we gave them was just we gave them four scenarios to understand how they thought cattle were raised. One was raised inside in confinement its entire life, outside in confinement their entire life, more of a grass fed operation and then more of a traditional operation where you start on pasture and move into a feed yard and so on. 43% of consumers chose that they believe most cattle were raised in confinement their entire life, 20% of that actually being inside as well for their entire life. Just shows you to how far we have to go on educating consumers. We also, in these focus groups and testing that we did, it had two camps emerge of what consumers believe is happening. Uh, you know, you can see this verbatim. You see documentaries, it's like a prison. They're all caged together. Really, there's this 
belief that that the industry is focused on money. It's large scale mass production. This is where the inhumane treatment, crowding, overuse of antibiotics and hormones and things like that are happening. And this is what they believe for the most part is the current state of the food production, specifically around beef. And then they also believe there are still some small family owned farms out there, but they believe it's more of a dying breed. It's also associated more with your niche style markets like your grass fed, your organic. Uh, they believe this is where the higher quality beef is being raised and the better living conditions are. And a lot of that's because of the visuals it gives them. So we actually see this as a tremendous opportunity because the things they associate with uh, these smaller family owned farms and the dying breed, we know that is representative of what's ha happening in the entire industry. So it really gives us an opportunity to use our platform and educate on these topics. So we introduced beef quality assurance to consumers at a high level, just a description on what it was, and then, you know, give them some facts about the program. And after that, we asked them, you know, about, after learning about BQA, did you become, do you think, are you more confident that the beef you eat is safe, that the animals are treated humanely? And how much did you agree that this represents beef that you could find at your grocery store? And what you're seeing on this slide is overwhelmingly a positive reaction. You see 70% agreeing in the confidence of beef they eat is safe, 67% on treated humanely, and 62% making consumers believe that this is beef they can find at their grocery store. And that's really an important one, and it's something that we, you know, kind of strive ourselves at the beef checkoff here because it's, you know, we can show one ranch or one family, and that's going to resonate really positive with consumers. But what that's also going to do is make them want to go and find their beef from that entity specifically. But how do we make that representative? Again, going back to they really don't know how cattle are raised. So how can we make them believe that this is actually the norm in the cattle industry that most cattle are raised and all cattle are raised in this type of environment? Another thing we saw after we introduced them to this is that going back to that positive and negative question, we had a significant shift. Over 26% of people shifted from being neutral or negative to a more positive view about about cattle and how they were raised by simply being introduced on what the program beef quality assurance was. But we also heard during the, these focus groups and the testing that we did that there's varying levels of information that consumers need. For most people, a general reassurance is enough. And that's what that check the box is. It's, we call them the check the box consumer. I just want to know something exists. And for the most part, knowing a program is out there that educates producers and has guidelines on how cattle are raised is enough. And then there's a smaller percentage of consumers that are going to dig into that research, want, want to know more information about that. So what we did at the Beef Checkoff is we went out and we made a video about beef quality assurance. It's a very high level video if you did uh, go across and we did some testing, some rigorous testing behind it to ensure that it really was what consumers wanted. And what overwhelmingly, what we saw is a very positive reaction. What you're seeing here is we do something called interest tracking, where a consumer takes their mouse and they drag their interest over the course of the ad that they're viewing. And we saw an overall positive sentiment towards this ad throughout the entirety. Even at the end, you know, our beef is what's for dinner brand and our sign off with that goo 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 really has a strong performance um, for our advertising. So it really is a good connection, even with something along the lines of production. And, most advertising, if you were to see this um, for other products and entities, you see it tail off towards the end of an interest tracking platform. The other thing this led us to is to understand that there are those consumers that want to know more. So yes, this video that was high level and educated on the Beef Quality Assurance Program was that initial step. And for a lot of people, that was enough. And it did really well, again, shifting a lot of those positive sentiments for us. However, for those people that wanted to know more, they could click through that video or some of the other advertising and just go to the Beef It's What's For Dinner page, learn more about Beef Quality Assurance, and give another level of detail. And now for those people that did want to learn more than that, we had a link at the bottom of that page that could bring them to the actual Beef Quality Assurance website where they could look at the guidelines of antibiotics, where they could dig into all those details. Now, I can tell you for the most part, most consumers weren't going to do that, and, and they didn't. But for those who did, it was there. It leaves a trail, if you will. And I think this is a really important setup on how we could maybe move forward. 
And so the goal of this campaign when it was launched is to help consumers continue to feel good about how beef is raised by highlighting beef quality assurance, specifically the safety uh, the humanely raised and the sustainability that goes behind it that consumers can really, really relate to. They want to know what's in it for them in terms of safety and a quality product, but they also want to know what's in it for the animal. So the campaign you know, did really well, had a great performance. You can see over 11 million video views, a lot of audio views as well, uh, 58.6 million media impressions when this launched, and this was in fall of 2019. And what this led to, going back to our tracker, we can go in and look at our measures and how things tracked during that time. We saw an increase in positive uh, perceptions about beef. We saw a decrease in the amount of people, which is a good thing, that said they had low familiarity in beef. Uh, so all in all, it didn't matter the measure we looked at with production. They all seemed to go up during the time that we were high with that. And really what this is telling us is this is a good approach we can take to address a variety of different topics around production that are a little more specific, if you will, uh, to create that trail for consumers. High level reassurance is going to be the thing that resonates with most, but give them that opportunity to find more. Now we want to jump into some of the current dynamics that we're seeing with COVID to date uh, in terms of what we're seeing, how it's impacting the food space and beef specifically. 84% of meals right now are being cooked at home. Now that was 88 to 90% in spring when this first happened. I think consumers are getting a bit more comfortable, whether it's with takeout or delivery options, depending on where you live. You know, there's some closer shutdowns than others. Now that change in behavior, most people are saying that that is an increase than what they normally would be, and that's probably not a surprise. But you know, what's interesting here as we talk about this is 66% of people, or nearly two thirds, are saying they're going to continue to cook more meals at home at least for a little while while everything's going on. So what did this lead to? Uh, you know, you can see most of those meals being cooked at home, which led to this stocking up dynamic when things started closing down back in spring. So what you're looking at on this slide is retail sales data from IRI. And specifically, if you see a good year in sales data, and this is dollars specifically, one to 2% growth for a meat commodity like beef, chicken, or pork is considered a really good year. And if you look at these numbers, they're pretty astronomical. I mean, 46, 52%, 37% in April. Uh, we have one week in March where we were 90% ahead year over year. You know, I talked to someone who works in the supply chain as a buyer and a category, and previously as a category manager for one of the top grocery chains. And they said in any one category, if we were 5 to 10% higher than we were a, a, on a week or several weeks in a row, we're going to have warehouse issues. And we were 40 to 50 percent higher, so that's what led to a lot of these out of stocks that you saw for a little bit for a little bit there. We have normalized and leveled off. You know, we're getting some of those uh, those September October numbers in that are still about 14 to 20 percent. So when I say leveling off, we're still 15 to 20 percent higher than we typically are. How about the food service? This is kind of a complete inverse relationship. So we were, this is transactional data, so the number of transaction, transactions happening at these establishments. We were 80% lower in transactions at full service restaurants. We were nearly 40% lower during spring with the quick service restaurants. And again, that's normalized or leveled off a little bit, and we're closer to that 15 to 10% lower year over year number as of this fall. So definitely doing better. Restaurants did a great job adapting to some of these delivery and takeout options that we had. And all in all, what does this mean when you put it all together? together? What you're seeing here is per capita net beef consumption. And what our 2020, we're still waiting for official numbers to come in here. But it looks like it's about a pound higher or so on the estimates from 2019. Originally back in spring when we ran into some of those issues with packing plants shutting down, we didn't necessarily know if that would be the case, but food service typically represents about 60% of our, the beef industry. And retail and what the dynamic that's been there has been enough to overcome that and a bit more this year. So it'll be interesting to see how that moves going forward, but we anticipate next year being a strong year as well. Another thing that's likely here to stay is online grocery and meal ordering. 
Uh, we saw a large uptick in this when this first started. We went out and did our own research on the topic. We found 67% of people said they were buying groceries, at least occasionally online during the peak of the pandemic. 86% said a, a consumer said they had ordered a meal online in some capacity from a food service restaurant. And if you look at that, numbers on the right here, nearly 70% of people said that increased or just started because of the pandemic. And what does this mean? Is What we've seen is consumers were actually really satisfied with their experiences through that survey. Even, even beef specifically and steak in some of these occasions, people were saying those barriers that they used to have, they were actually satisfied with, with what they were getting. And because of that, we've sped up an adoption. And what you're seeing here is the compound annual growth rate for the projections on e-commerce for groceries specifically. So this purple line represents what was anticipated, which was already growing, you know, one, two percent a year. But we saw a big jump, about seven percent of retail sales going to the e-commerce space. And now we've kind of restructured how that growth rate will go with another one to two percent nearly every year here through the next three or four years. So it, it is here to stay. Uh, that's, we feel pretty confident in that and will continue to be something that the beef checkoff takes advantage of. Uh, we've done some promoting, whether it's recipes and so on, that consumers can look at through the summer and at winter as well, this previous summer and winter. Another thing, just to show you some more of that data, you know, at the beginning I showed you that weekly consumption. Well, in 2019, 67% of consumers were saying they're eating beef weekly or more. Now that average that I showed you was 72% and just for 2020. And just to see how those numbers have trended, you can see it peaked in spring. But overall, consumers are eating more beef than they did a year ago. And I think that's just a positive story that we can hang up on when, when they were kind of pressed to the wall. They wanted to have beef in their freezers or in, in their fridge so they could rely on that product. They consider it a great value. Uh, it helps mix up their meals. Very versatile, especially for ground beef specifically. Even willingness to pay. I mean, consumers are not spending as much, at least currently, on activities out of the house or at food service. And you can see their willingness to pay trends at retail for ground beef and for steak went right up along with prices. Now, prices did go up in May and June and started coming back down a little bit and then started going back up again in November. But you can see consumers are riding that train right along with it. You know, they're not spending that money, so they're willing to almost trade up and spend a little bit more at retail to help mix up those meals during this time. And when we, even when we looked at perceptions, and this is positive production perceptions and how people feel, again, 2019, our average was 38%. We only had one week, and that was during the Beef Quality Assurance Campaign previous to 2019, that we had over 40% of people feeling positive about how beef is raised. And these numbers nearly hit 50% in several weeks in 2020. So overall, consumers are not as negative and not as concerned about production-related reasons, at least temporarily during all of this. A lot of that can just be that there's a lot on the consumer mindset right now, uh, whether it's thinking about the economy for a little while, your job security, kids going back to school, obviously the pandemic as a whole. At least temporarily, maybe those things are making consumers not think as much about how their food is raised or at least as negatively about how it's raised. And there's been a lot of tremendous opportunity. Uh, a lot of other things, you know, we were asking about were what can encourage, you know, keeping beef in those in your freezer? What can make you purchase more beef options? And really what we're seeing is consumers are looking for those ideas, those meal ideas, quick and easy meal ideas, meal prep, um, you know, how to use products in your pantry. You can even see ideas on how to use ground beef, and ground beef has been a huge success story, where it's represented over 43% of that additional dollar growth that we have seen in retail. It's also something that represents our versatility and our convenience, and that's really what consumers have been looking for and what has been driving meat consumption during the pandemic, and ground beef has been a great answer for that. So all in all, just to finish up here with what we see happening and just to give you an idea how the checkoff transitioned, you know, we came out and we wanted to make sure we had the facts available when COVID came out 
Uh, you know, so we had a place on our website for consumers to go about coronavirus and about some of those frequently asked questions specifically that might come up. But also a big focus became what we just touched on, making sure consumers had what they needed from us in terms of popular dishes like classic meatloaf, burgers, meatballs, things that they could cook with that ground beef they had on hand and some of those roast and steaks they'd be stocking up on as well. Another thing you're going to continue to see from the beef checkoff that was addressed last year as well is just talking about myths in general and this production story that we've talked about. Yes, you know, beef quality assurance and those uh, assets have continued to be part of the rotation, but we've also been using a lot of these uh, kind of tongue-in-cheek approach to addressing whether it's the environment with nicely done beef, you flourish where crops fail, uh, or even some things like nutrition, nicely done beef when you your super who needs supplements. So just to give you an idea, these will still continue to be there. While consumers are thinking positively and eating more beef, we want to be top of mind with consumers. Sustainability is going to be a big focus area for us as we move in to continue to move into 2021. Uh, so that'll be something you'll hear more from the beef checkup on in, in this spring. With that, I just wanted to say thank you for your time. I'm excited to be able to answer some questions after this session. Uh, you can see my contact information here. And once again, it's always a pleasure to be able to talk with everyone helping bring food from, you know, pasture to plate again. And hopefully we were able to share a little bit of insight on what's going on with that mind of consumer today. So once again, I'm Sean Darcy on the market research team with National Cowman's Beef Association. And thank you for your time today. Well, Sean, thank you for a great presentation on market uh, research that's uh, out there. And again, just as a quick reminder to folks, uh, if you've got questions for our speakers, we are going to answer um, uh, two to three of those, and then uh, we'll give you all time to type those in. And all of our speakers will remain on board this evening until the end. So that will give you all plenty of time to uh, think about questions through uh, this evening. Sean, I've got a, a few questions that came in. And uh, the first question is, are there any particular cuts of beef um, that seem to be moving up more than other cuts uh, in the retail side? Oh, you know, that's an interesting question. Can, I, can we say all of them? Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's hard to identify one specific cut, particularly this year because the sales have been so high across the board. I think about five to $6 billion higher just for beef in the retail space. Uh, ground being about 43% of that increase that we're seeing. But across the board, you're seeing 15 to 26% increases on most of your state cuts. You know, I think ribeye was up 10%. It's so hard to tell because your big selling steaks look like it's a smaller percentage, right? So your strip steaks, your ribeye steaks, and so on are about 10% higher year over year, your tenderloin, you know, your filet mignon, your tenderloin steaks, about 10% higher than they have been, but they also represent most of the volume. Uh, so your flank steaks, your strip steaks, a lot of those smaller and less volume cuts do show a larger increase, but it's just because they're really buying up everything this year. I have another question that came in that's a good question that tied into the, the end of your discussion a little bit was, is there any information or has there been any research conducted looking at beef and the potential of them, uh, maybe either live animal and or meat product, I'm interpreting the question, to transmit COVID? So the actual cattle themselves conducting it or consumers believing that that will happen? Um, I think it's actual cattle because it says beef cattle um, basically getting COVID-19 themselves. You know, I can't really speak as an expert to that. We have a beef safety team here uh, led up by Dr. Mandy Carr Johnson that I think can speak to that. But I do know we have resources on beef. It's what's for dinner. Uh, that, that you can answer on beef, uh, COVID-19 and beef. And it, essentially, the, there has been research, I think, I don't know if specifically into COVID or if it's been completed, uh, but there are guidelines they've put together on what they believe through the research that has been conducted thus far. And what I'm seeing in that is that there is no 
Uh, it is not the same and they cannot contract that, but I do recommend going out there. There's a full Q and A, if you will, on some of those top questions. Here's another one that I think you'll be able to, um, to answer is, what's your thoughts or, or thinking about what potential strategies might there be to hold on to these great increase in demand and sales once uh, the kind of COVID demand begins to deplenish or, or kind of ease off? In terms of retail, are we, are we thinking, I'm thinking there, you know, I, I do think there's going to be some normalizing and then cattle facts put together some rejections looking at some food service that this year it's about usually 60 40 for food service 40% for retail. This year it's going to be about 50 50 for volume, and it probably will be about 55 45 next year, but probably eventually will normalize. I don't think we're going to reset that. Uh, it's more of a su supply and demand style of issue. The beef that's available probably will be consumed there. Uh, I do think the e-commerce space is definitely something that's here to stay and that demand specifically will continue to increase uh, as we move forward, especially as it relates to the grocery area. People are going to be eager to get back into restaurants, definitely. Uh, but some of these online avenues are definitely going to increase for both of them. And uh, we'll answer one more question before we move on. And uh, don't worry, the other questions that came in, we'll, uh, we'll get to those here in a bit. Um, there was a question that came in that uh, Kroger seems to be pushing plant-based foods heavily on their digital coupon platform, while there's rarely offerings for real meat products. Are they trying to build demand or is the interest that high for plant-based meat products or plant-based foods? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I don't think I can answer that directly from Kroger's perspective on why they might be promoting those necessarily. I mean, what we see in our data is there, you know, there's interest in those products and there's been an increased interest in those, but it's still a very nominal amount. It's less than 1%. You know, if we were to put all the beef substitutes in the beef category and all the animal substitutes in the animal protein category, it represents under 1% of all sales dollars in volume. That has increased, you know, looking back since 2015 and 16, when you had Beyond and Impossible launching and those type of items. But I think it's more the money and the promotional dollars that they have behind it, that they're willing to put behind those things. They have a lot of big backers uh, behind those big brands. And that's most likely uh, why they're trying to do that. Their newer products keep them top of mind with consumers. And then we've got two questions that came in that are that are. I'm going to say closely related, and um, I, I don't know if you'll be able to answer it, but perhaps uh, you can. They, they both relate to um, local beef. And so the question one is, do you have any data on the increase in local meat processing bought directly off the farm? And the second question that's very similar is, as a beef producer, we've seen an increase in public purchasing of beef from farmers. Have you seen this trend nationwide? You know, it's interesting, you know, to address the first one, I would say that data is really hard to come by. It's something we're interested in doing and may look at here in 2021 as the beef checkoff. Uh, we have heard a lot of those rumblings as well with consumers. A lot of that uh, goes back to whether it was supply outages, out of stocks, people you know, freezers, I think we're out of stock forever. So there's a lot of people going, uh, going and getting freezers and stocking up. So they had the means to be able to go out and purchase more product and do things along those lines. Uh, this, that might have been driving some of that. So no, I don't have any hard data there. We have seen that as well. Uh, and I think it's something that we'll address uh, as the beef checkoff as we look at it. But I think there's interest there, but I, don't, I would say the interest has been across the board, whether you're looking at butcher shops, specialty grocers, even your mask merchandisers and grocery stores have all increased. Fantastic. Well, at this time, Sean, on behalf of the Beef Efficiency uh, Committee, again, I'd like to thank you for joining us this evening and appreciate a great uh, set of information there and all the work that you're doing through the checkoff and uh, collecting that consumer data that will help us think about positioning beef to make it stronger in the marketplace as we move forward in this year and, and the future for certain. So thanks for joining us this evening. Uh, again, Sean will be with us the entire evening. So if you've got questions that come to mind, be sure to type those in the Q&A. 
Um, I will now ask that we consider sharing again uh, a few words from our sponsors. I believe that there's no better female in the cattle industry than Beefmaster Female. When Mr. Laster started this breed, efficiency and, and reproduction was everything with Beefmaster. So we've continued to go on with that and even push that uh, maternal index harder than before. We've measured and we've worked at it for 33 years. So the cattle will grade, they'll yield, they'll perform. They're some of the best milking females in the cattle industry. The efficiencies are unparalleled by any other breed. Here at Berkman Nutrition, we committed over 40 years ago to provide nutritional support, premium feeds, and exceptional service to Kentucky farm families. Now more than ever, producers need assistance developing health protocols and nutrition programs to meet market demands. Our highly trained team is here to help you reach your operation goals. We are proud to be your complete resource in the beef business. This time, it's my pleasure to turn the program back over to uh, my colleague, Dr. Jones, and Dr. Jones will introduce our next uh, speaker. Dr. Jones, take it away. Thank you, Jeff. Our next speaker on the program is a young man named Dr. Chad Carr. Dr. Carr grew up in Bethpage, Tennessee on a diversified farm. It was a purebred Hampshire swine farm, but also had a commercial cow-calf operation. Dr. Carr was very active in 4-H as a youngster. In fact, he was on the meat judging team in Tennessee. And while on the meat judging team from Tennessee, 4-H team, he won the national 4-H meat judging contest. Dr. Carr came one year to Western Kentucky University. And after a year here, he decided he wanted to go to a university where he could be on the championship meat judging team. So he transferred to Oklahoma State University. He did his BS and master's degree at Oklahoma State University. And while he was a graduate student at Oklahoma State University, he coached the national championship meat judging team. Chad then went to the University of Missouri to complete his PhD in meat science. After completing his PhD at the University of Missouri, he took a position in the animal science department at the University of Florida, where he is today. Dr. Chad is an associate professor of animal science at the University of Florida. He teaches various classes in meat science and one of the interesting classes that Dr. Carr teaches is his consumer meats class. And uh, it might be a little hard to believe this, but he teaches this class online. And he's had over 50,000 students enrolled in his uh, consumer meats class. Dr. Carr is also in charge of the meats judging program and the live animal and livestock judging programs at the University of Florida. Dr. Carr and his wife have two daughters and those young daughters are, one of the older one is now getting involved in 4-H livestock. Uh, Dr. Carr is really involved in working with the meat industry in Florida and the various uh, entities in the meat industry and in keeping this, the food safe and trying to learn about quality and that sort of thing. And so we thought Dr. Carr would be an ideal one to give us a presentation tonight. So Dr. Carr, we appreciate your being with us tonight. All right. Well, I'm going to hit on a few of the things that Dr. Jones asked me to visit about as it associates with what has really happened here since the pandemic has started. I work at the University of Florida as an extension meat guy, and there have been an overwhelming number of calls that I have gotten about folks throughout the U.S. that are trying to establish a direct-to-consumer meat business of some sort or certainly there has been a lot of discussion as to trying to establish kind of some regional fed beef operations to kind of get away from some of the centralized system that we currently really have and, and 
just going to talk about some of those opportunities and prognosticate a little bit of stuff. But before we get into that, one of the first things that Dr. Jones wanted me to discuss was to talk about a, a little bit of general concepts relative to, to what we do in this country in terms of our large scale commercial grain based beef feeding and processing business kind of the science associated with how we produce high quality grain fed beef in the U.S. And it is the hallmarks which are written right here on this slide. Um, the U.S. system is based on the idea that we would have a calf that at whatever age that he goes into the feed yard, whether it's a, a recently weaned calf, you know, a, a nine month old calf or something that it would be a long yearling that they would be on feed for probably at least 120 to 180 days uh, on a high concentrate diet. And that associates with through extensive genetic selection that we have had in this country within all, essentially all major U.S. breeds uh, to have uh, intensive selection for marbling deposition or fat deposition within the muscle. And uh, animals are harvested at, you know, I don't know, 1,400 pounds steers, something like whatever, about 17 months of age generally. And he's going to make something like a 900 pound carcass. And when you go to the grocery store, that beef, the middle meats that you would purchase, they've probably been in transit and associated with post slaughter uh, aging somewhere probably around two days. With food service, it might be an addition, or two weeks, sorry. Uh, with food service, that might be an additional week, something like three weeks. But it doesn't, there's other systems that do things differently, but as a whole, that's kind of the U.S. system that has been established. So he wanted me to visit real briefly about the differences between grain-fed U.S. commercial product and what a U.S. source grass-fed product would be. And uh, this was something that we had. We have a, a look. Uh, uh, grass-fed beef purveyor there in our state and uh, this was some of their product as compared to something that I bought commercially at Sam's and as a whole this would be indicative of, of, of what you might expect with something that truly has gotten no grain supplementation whatsoever um, have I had some good grass-fed beef yeah I have and you all probably have too it, the chances though that you might have if you eat a hundred grass-fed steaks the chances that there's going to be more of them that won't hit the mark in terms of being highly palatable is probably going to be more substantial as compared to when we do include grain in the ration, uh, more according to what our large scale commercial systems kind of driven like. So grass fed beef, like this slide says, we're going to generate carcasses that are leaner externally and within the muscle. That product will tend to have more off flavors. It'll tend to be a little tougher and a little less juicy. Uh, there is a little difference in fatty acid profile, but that's what it kind of generally consists of. And uh, now there are folks that there are Americans that, that uh, in, in surveys that say that they prefer grass fed product. But sometimes maybe when you put the, the added uh, economic disincentive, I guess, the fact that that product is generally more expensive due to the greater production cost, some of that uh, preference kind of runs out of gas. This was from a. Uh, this isn't new data. Uh, if we want to establish some kind of pasture fed system, this was work from uh, Steve May's, uh, Dr. Steve May's uh, dissertation at Oklahoma State. And we kind of found that somewhere around that 120 days of, of feeding, that's kind of when we maximize, it takes about 90 days to change yellow fat that we would have from a grass based system to white fat. And then in another month or so, to uh, make the product some have somewhere around four tenths of an inch of fat and improve tenderness there. So the U.S. system, as I said, we're based largely upon marbling and it's certainly not perfect, but over a wide range, it has application to produce high quality beef uh, as it associates with highly palatable, tender, juicy and flavorful product. So with dentition, and this is a fairly recent change. Um, USDA FSIS has utilized dentition since 2003 relative to 30 months of age as it associates with BSE and specified risk material. But we just more recently found that dentition is probably a better indicator of real palatability as compared to 
uh, skeletal maturity. So those animals which are uh, deciphered by dentition to be less than 30 months of age, they are eligible for the best grades. If they're over 30 months of age, like we see over here where we have uh, those two, the incisors that's coming above, that second incisor coming above the gum line, they might be eligible for the best grades relative to skeletal maturity, or they might be eligible only for the cow grade. So that's over 30 months. And so that's where we utilize the skeletal maturity. The, the biggest percentage of cattle that we have in this country are less than 30 months of age relative to dentition. And so the driver is marbling. This is how it's done today in a large scale commercial system. We utilize instrumentation and this is facilitated certainly by USDA. marketing service but uh oh, came here was some amount of marbling associated with those quality grades so slight double zero that's somewhere around now i don't know three and a half to four percent fat within the muscle small double zero be the minimum requirement to be low choice that's about five percent fat or so within the muscle Modest, double zero, that's somewhere around 7% fat within the muscle. And slightly abundant is getting on somewhere around 10% fat within the muscle. That's the minimum requirement for USDA Prime. And over a wide range, like I said, the quality grades are certainly not perfect to predict uh, high quality beef, but it does a good job. And uh, this is work from Mallory Emerson's work uh, when she was a graduate student, Dr. Tatum's last graduate student at Colorado State. And uh, we can just see as we scoot along here. So premium choice would be modest or more. And uh, that looks pretty good. Uh, low choice looks pretty good. And in this particular work here relative to overall consumer satisfaction and uh, select didn't look that good. So, but uh, there's that. One of the other component associated with the uh, dentition and the age as an animal gets older, the collection of connective tissue that organizes around every layer of organization of an animal's muscle, it becomes more intricate, okay? And there will become more collagen cross-links there around every organization of that muscle. I keep talking about more pickets in the fence. And then that product will not be as soluble, the tender, the that collagen will be less soluble as we cook it and you'll pick it up as more connective tissue and that kind of that uh, elastic band, it just kind of gets bigger as you chew it. That's that continued component that we have there with connective tissue. So uh, in terms of external fatness and how that associates with quality grades. So over this shows, this is from the 2011 uh, National Beef Quality Audit. So when we get an animal, you know, dependent upon their genetic predisposition, they probably have to have about um, 35 hundredths of an inch of fat to have much confidence in their uh, ability to grade choice. And if we have some dairy influenced cattle, it'd be a little bit less. But for most English and continental influenced cattle, that'd be the threshold up to somewhere around six tenths of an inch of fat. The incentive that if we look here in terms of the percentage of grade choice or better, when we get more than six tenths of an inch of fat, uh, as it associates with grading choice or better, it, it's not that good. So we want to have enough fat that we would have some confidence in their ability to grade choice externally, um, but not so much that we have to trim a lot off. Because when we get past this six tenths or so inch of fat, we're going to darn sure when we get past eight tenths an inch of fat, we're going to get into cattle that will receive discounts relative to the amount of fat trimming that they'll have to have prior to generating pieces that will be shipped to food service or purveyors, retail, et cetera, that'd be a yield grade four or uh, even worse would be a yield grade five. So we gotta have some external fat. And so uh, this is just some stuff from class that we had. So we have kind of an underfinished uh, continental influence steer there on the top left that generates a barely select carcass. It's real high cutability. Uh, one that's kind of on target here. Here's an old slide down here of a yield grade two select steer and you can kind of see its composition in a yield grade five, turn back the clock guy there <clears throat> that's um, really, really low cutability. So they, we kind of have to hit the, the sweet spot there in, in terms of what we're gonna do. 
in terms of how the U.S. system works relative to managing tenderness, it's almost done indirectly. <laughs> um, and so by the time that we get wholesale beef subprimals distributed around the country or headed to export whatever we're doing, almost invariably that product will be at least at 10 days post-mortem age. And we can see this is what goes on in terms of post-mortem aging and its relationship with beef tenderness. So early on, uh, those enzymes, those calpanes enzymes, we've not allowed them time to really work um, and to break down those sarcomeres there at the edge of those muscles to improve beef tenderness over time. It takes a little time for that to occur. And 4.5 kilograms, that's what we're showing here on the left-hand side, that would be 10 pounds. If we're less than 10 pounds, people perceive that as being tender. Uh, so we start off a lot of stuff. We'll start off eh, okay for tenderness there, early, early postmortem. But with time, those endogenous enzymes, when we age that product in a vacuum seal bag, or if it happens to be dry aged or whatever the case may be, by the time we have tra it transported to wherever it's going, we've really improved the tenderness and it's probably going to be pretty acceptable uh, and will be tender by the time that it gets there. This is based on some stuff just on the ribeyes, but there's that. So that kind of hits on some big picture stuff about the U.S. system. It's based on uh, grain-based beef, uh, grain-based feeding, uh, the importance of marbling as it associates with generating that grain-fed, buttery fat flavor, uh, post-mortem aging, just making a highly palatable product, okay? doesn't have to be that way. I mean, you, there's other things that can work, but um, as a whole, that's a blueprint that works pretty well. I'm going to change gears here for a little bit and talk about opportunities if somebody wants to start their own niche meat marketing program. Uh, there's some challenge there. Uh, and I, with the pandemic, pandemic since it's hit, there's been a lot of folks that are just trying to merchandise their product purely as local. Uh, I'm going to quote my good buddy, Dr. David Newman. David, he's a hog guy, and uh, he's currently the president of the National Pork Board. And David, they are in the niche pork business. And David says, in his opinion, and I probably tend to agree with him, for the long haul, uh, if you plan to have a niche meat marketing program, that you probably need to do something other than just local. There probably needs to be some other credence values that you're heading toward. That's not definitive. That's his opinion, but I kind of tend to agree with it. Um, but you kind of got to figure out where you're going to go with it and the demographics it's going to have uh, for your target audience. So if you want to, you got out, you got 100 cows, and we want to merchandise. Um, whatever. The biggest portion of your steer calves this year is freezer beef, and you have the commodity resources to do that, that's an opportunity, right? Uh, today, it's challenging today, uh, it's challenging to be able to get a spot to merchandise, or to have your uh, cattle slaughtered and converted into component pieces. If that product, if it is slaughtered and fabricated into component pieces and we've got a label and an inspection bug on it it can be sold legally on a piece by piece basis that can happen if you want to say you're going to sell them the whole animal or a portion of the animal that can be custom and if you're going to do less than whatever 30 to 50 a year um i think you can do that right i mean i, I think they're there's some opportunity for that. You gotta gotta be willing to work hard and hustle and peddle your wares. But uh, I, I've seen instances of lots of folks that have had some success doing that. I think, in my opinion, I think the the application of science that we talked about in terms of consumer satisfaction, I think it still applies here. But I think there's some opportunity there. Now. In terms of what some of our folks in our state have done in terms of trying to establish a regional fed beef system and establish something that is beyond freezer beef, there's some challenge with it, right? Um, there is a reason that we have 900,000 900, calves in our state uh, in Florida that largely 90% um, of them or so go to the middle of the country for those subsequent stages of production. It's been cost effective, right? 
And so to make that work, and in some ways you all in Kentucky would be set up pretty good in terms of having better access to feed resources than we do in our state, for sure. Uh, I'm not that sure about how many folks historically in the state of Kentucky or in this part of the world have had much experience feeding fed cattle. That's one thing that's interesting about our state that we've actually had some not, not that long ago. Some of the challenges that I've dealt with for some of our big ranches that are trying to establish a branded beef program, you got to have a year round supply, right? And uh, if we have all of our calves born within a you know, 45 day window in the fall when we have some of the calves in the spring, well, the, the, it can work, right? Uh, but it, you kind of got to spread that out year round. We have done some things with how uh, we have merchandised cattle to try to minimize labor resources and challenges there that, that actually work against this a little bit. The biggest thing, probably in my opinion, uh, is this next component here, and that's cost effective slaughter and processing. We'll hit on that some. And you got to be able to sell this product, right? Uh, we can raise them. We can do a nice job finishing them. Uh, we can get them slaughtered and cut into component pieces and, and look well. But uh, we got to we got to get it merchandised, right? So and we have to be able to get that done uh, at a price point where there's going to be some profit. And so there's some challenge with all that. I'll tell this story about slaughter facilities that as it associates with challenge with rendering. My good buddy Larry Eubanks, when he started managing the meat lab at the University of Florida in 1970, they would have received some value for their offal. After about 10 years or so, Griffin Industries, they would still come and pick up the offal, but we wouldn't get anything for it. Today, we have to pay them to come pick up our offal. And so smaller facilities, it, even up to medium-sized facilities, what you do and the opportunity to make any money with your drop credit, uh, what's going on with the hides, that's a big challenge, right? Um, really big challenge. If uh, we're going to try that, we'll hit on this a little bit. If you're going to try to start a new facility, there can be some big time challenges depending upon where you are relative to local permitting and getting that through um, gov local governance. Um, and if you haven't had previous experience, with bringing a facility under federal inspection. Inspection is eight hours of federal inspection is free. That's right. Uh, but if you haven't been down that road, uh, there's there's some challenge with some of that. It's not, uh, uh, it's not, it's, it's uncharted territory for somebody that hasn't been in that direction. Here's a big thing here. I know that you all uh, have heard a little bit of this from Dr. Jones about some of the challenges. We have the, cattle that are ready to go, we can uh, do a nice job slaughtering them and generating component pieces that are high quality and well packaged. You know, but to, to merchandise to most larger customers that we're going to have, we're going to have to have a series of food safety and uh, probably animal welfare audits that uh, we might not, uh, we're aware of, right? And, uh, and so suddenly, uh, we uh, can be out of position, right? We need to have a facility that probably has the ability to, to, to go under GFSI auditing and whatever other third-party food safety and animal welfare auditing that is. So most of the very small facilities that we have in our state don't have the ability, and in, in, in my state of Florida, do not have the ability to hit the mark with most of these auditing entities. Um, Everybody wants the steaks, right? We got pigs, everybody wants the bacon. We don't have any problems selling the steaks and the bacon. But uh, what are we going to do with those ends? That's where the value, that's where the bulk of the, uh, that's where the bulk of the tonnage is. What are we going to do with the offal, right? Uh, how do we do that to make that work? Other things, so um, labor is a challenge for everybody doing everything in agriculture, right? Small facilities have folks that have more experience and can do more things and associated with a whole cascade of stuff as compared to uh, just doing this one specific job, right? And uh, it's hard to find that labor. And here's the other thing, and, and you all are familiar with this. If um, who, Who's our competitor here? If, uh, if our competitor is Tyson Fresh Meats, JBS, Cargill, that's a that's a tough sell, right? It, it's uh, in terms of the commodity 
size, scale, and efficiency that they have, uh, our price points are not going to be the same. And uh, that, that's a real challenge, right? Now, with that, some of the opportunities you all have, I think you guys have a real good start with this strong uh, bulk account beef market that you all have and are adding some value to that. So that's, that's, that's excellent. As I stated, maybe as compared to us in, uh, in Florida, you all probably have a little bit ac better access for price effective commodities and uh, feed resources than we do. You all certainly have genetics associated with generating quality fed beef. And so those things are all positives. But uh, I don't know. I want to hit just a little bit here. And I know nobody has said anything necessarily about building a processing facility. But if you do, I just want to hit on a few things. You need to do a feasibility study and you need to get something with somebody that really knows what they're doing. That's what I'd suggest you to do. Uh, this niche meat processing.org website, they do an awesome job, but this is expensive. All right. Everybody, there's been a lot of excitement. Oh, we're going to build a packing plant. Okay. All right. Um, talking about a lot of money, right? And uh, it can get legs quick. Uh, Rob Maddock and Travis Maddock, this is uh, these consultants that they have worked with there in North Dakota. This is kind of where they were, somewhere around this $400 per square foot. So just to kind of spitball this just a little bit more at uh, for something like a hundred head per day facility, uh, you're talking about $12 million just to kind of get that. And that wouldn't be, you know, buying any cattle for that first week either. And uh, depending upon where you might be, that might be twice again tight. So if uh, if you want to build a packing plant, there's opportunity there, but it, it can be challenging. Uh, you know, uh, our, our buddies there that have started the Florida Cattle Ranchers program, they, they've done an excellent job feeding the cattle. They have done an excellent job in terms of telling their story of sustainability and uh, the, uh, the old Florida way and generating some really nice product. But um, the, you know, to have the, where the, the mass and tonnage to, to be able to merchandise um, all that a large commercial processor can, you know, if you got whatever, uh, if we're gonna have, I don't know, uh, melts or uh, kidneys, well, we got a few here. We killed. We, we got it. Takes tonnage to be able to merchandise that and export it. So, um, just something to consider. So, who are? What if you're gonna try to have a branded program? You got to get with the contract packer, and you gotta you gotta be married to it, right? You got to prepare for a for a long haul, and you got to get your math right. You got to sharpen that pencil. So, kind of what they've done in California, the Harris Ranch system. I would say has probably been the most successful model. And I've just br visited briefly about what my friends in our state, uh, the Florida Cattle Ranchers Program is working to do. And, uh, and I'd encourage you to look at their deal and they have, uh, they've put a lot of effort in. And, uh, and so there's that. Take home here, uh, this local online uh, direct to consumer deal, is that going to be temporary or sustaining? I'm not sure. I don't know the answer to that, uh, but I do think that there probably needs to be, I think you probably need to have something a little other than just local. Uh, there is science associated with making high quality U.S. grain fed beef, and it's true. Um, if you want to sell some freezer beef, I think you can do that, uh, but if uh, there, you, that, that can happen, right? You just got to be willing to work hard and hustle and uh, get your ducks in a row, find a processor that's willing to work with you and tell your story and merchandise on social media, et cetera, make it happen. But establishing a, a substantial regional fed beef, branded beef program of consequence, there's a lot of, I'm not saying it can't happen, because I think it can, um, but, uh, but there's a lot of challenge there uh, and, uh, and a lot of nuance to making that go. And uh, there's just, you know, the large scale processors they, there are added efficiencies that are challenging uh, with a, an upstart facility or a regional fed beef facility. So some of that, take that for what it's worth, but uh, I've blowed through a lot, but I look forward to visiting with you all with the questions. Thanks.
Thank you, Chad. That was a great presentation and covered a lot of different aspects there. I think Dr. Jones will be uh, coming back on here in just a second with us. But uh, I did get one question that came in through the chat box and it said, if you were direct marketing grain, finished, boss tars, beef, grading choice or higher, what would be your desired number of hanging days? Yes, sir. Mr. Lowe, I would say probably we showed that one slide there. Historically, when you get much past two weeks post-mortem aging, um, we, we've done most of what we're going to do. So to maximize tenderness, really 10 days to two weeks will we'll maximize most of uh, what that post-mortem enzymatic tenderization will, will happen. It will become slightly more tender after a longer period of time, but two weeks will catch the biggest percentage of it. The biggest improvement is saw within the first 10 days. Um, a question that I'd, I'd like to pose to you uh, here in, in the state, um, we have a, a local sourced um, beef product. It, it's a ground beef product coming from uh, cull cows and adding value to cull cows. Um, you know, we, when we think about hanging days, um, you know, some, some folks we know are also maybe thinking about um, uh, butchering on farm. I know Dr. Renfro here has mentioned that he's had quite a bit of interest in uh, on farm butchering as well. Um, just discuss maybe a little bit of the differences that one might expect between a, a six to eight year old cow versus a, a 18 month fed steer or heifer. Yes, sir. So if we, uh, the primary difference you'll have between, yeah, let's say that we have to Dr. Lemkuller to kind of put them on the same plane, let's say. Let's say we have an eight-year-old dairy cow, okay, that's been on a high plane of nutrition, but she's a repro slaughter. She's a repro cull, okay? She's, she's, she's too fat. Let's compare her to that 18-month-old steer. So they've been fed almost exactly the same. The taste of that product will be pretty comparable. It might be a little stronger, somewhat stronger with that seven or eight year old repro. Not that that many dairy cows are gonna be uh, culled at that age, but let's say we do have one that is culled at that age. Most of the difference that we would have would be in the tenderness of that product, which would be due to that uh, greater amount of collagen cross-linking that we would have in, those, uh, in that aged cow. So we showed real briefly what goes on to the vertebrae of uh, along the backbone. It's the same thing that happens to us when we age. And that uh, collagen or that um, uh, the connective tissue, it will start to ossify. And that's also kind of concomitant with what happens with that connective tissue around those muscle fibers. And it's just less soluble. And so it'll be substantially tougher stakes. But there's, you know, those cull cows, we, uh, we do quite a bit of stuff here with the cull cows uh, in the, our operations here in this state with some of our larger ranches, particularly with kind of realimenting those cows for, you know, 60 to 90 days and uh, taking that yellow fat, putting them on a high plane of nutrition. They can probably add, you know, 50 pounds of carcass within 60 to 90 days, uh, depending upon how you implant them and how you feed them, et cetera. And you can you can take a, a pretty, you know, an okay cull cow, but really add quite a bit of value and make some still pretty highly palatable middle meat steaks, particularly if we uh, help them with needle tenderizing or tropical plant enzymes, something like that. Great. And uh, Mr. Warren Beeler wanted to, to let you know, great job. And uh, he also wanted to follow up on that and that we've had success on and adding value to those cull cows. Have you seen any examples of this in Florida on trying to uh, market cull cows? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We, uh, our largest processor in the state, we've kind of had some jockeying around here, but uh, uh, Central Beef, when I moved here, they were slaughtering old 350 cows a day and then probably so about four years ago, they got into slaughtering about 900 cows a day, and uh, then they shut down, and it's been sold, and now uh, they're back to operating. But yeah, they're they're almost exclusively a cull cow operation. We don't have anything with that facility though that is specifically marketing a Florida product. What I talked about with Florida cattle ranchers 
is a group, uh, they probably account for about 200,000 mother cows in our state. And we have three feed yards. When I moved here 13 years ago, we did not have a commercial feed yard operating at that time. But uh, not all 200,000 of those animals are coming through uh, this other processor that we have in the state, but they have established a, um, a branded fed beef program. And, uh, but like I talked about, probably the biggest challenge that they have had has been, you know, getting rid of their grinds. That's, and, and to do that at a price point that it's cost effective for a, a pretty modest sized processor. That's a great insight and, and had another question that came in that you mentioned Harris Ranch as a success story. Uh, what is their niche or their business model that made them successful? Well, they, they live in California and, uh, and so they're pretty geographically isolated. I live on a peninsula. We're pretty darn geographically isolated. And so they, uh, they built this business and, and drove it around the idea of, you know, uh, this is a California generated product and um, it's been quite a success and they, they're somewhat integrated. You know, they don't have any mother cows to my knowledge, but they certainly have a, you know, a substantial feeding operation. And then there's other outfits, which, uh, which are feeding, you know, some dairy caves in that part of the world, which go into that product as well. So, but um yeah, it's worked pretty well. It has worked pretty well. Fantastic. Well, um, uh, Dr. Carr, thank you for your presentation this evening. And um, we'll, we'll continue to take questions. Uh, just as a reminder, if you've got questions for uh, any of our speakers, just be sure to type those in the Q&A box and we'll get to those. Our speakers are hanging with us this evening the entire time. And at this time, uh, Becky, let's uh, hear some more words from our sponsorships uh, this evening. The backbone of America has been built on handshakes. In a handshake, there is trust, honesty, and a mutual commitment to building a long lasting relationship. At Farm Credit Mid-America, we remain true to those principles. And while the world around us may be changing, we remain focused on securing the future of rural communities and agriculture. One home, one farm, and one business at a time. When it comes to cattle handling, Tartar Farm and Ranch Equipment has the chutes, sweep systems, and feeders that protects your investment and eases your workload. Tartar Squeeze chutes provide the safest, quickest, and most consistent way to work cattle. Our complete alley and sweep system kits create a low-stress environment. And Tartar feeders increase your return on investment by cutting back on hayways. At Tartar, we make working cattle easier with equipment that works as hard as you do. All right. Thanks again to all of our sponsors this evening. Uh, Dr. Jones, I'm going to turn the program back over to you. Thank you, Jeff. Our third speaker of the evening uh, is going to take a little different approach here. Dr. Neville Spears, our third speaker. And I know of no one in the industry who probably has, I call it, has the finger on the pulse of the beef cattle industry any better than Dr. Neville Spears does. Uh, before COVID began, uh, Dr. Spear and I would get together for breakfast about every two weeks. So we had very enjoyable discussions about the beef industry. And when we started talking about this thing of taking uh, cattle and thinking more about the food we produce and that kind of thing, I thought it would be good to ask Neville to be involved here to talk to us about the entire industry, where we've been, where we are, and where we might be going. Uh, Dr. Spear is a uh, He's the president of Turkey Track Consulting and he consults with IMI Global. He's director of the industry relations for where food comes from. Uh, and I know of no one who's really studied the evolution of cattle marketing system in the US for the last 20 years anymore than Dr. Spear has. So uh, Dr. Neville Spear and his wife Lydia live in Bowling Green, Kentucky. They have a daughter who is a uh, freshman at Western Kentucky University. 
Dr. Spear, we're very pleased to have you with us this afternoon and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Gordon. Well, greetings in advance. 2020 with COVID has required all of us to do new and different things. And so I say in advance because I am recording this presentation on December 17th. Um, that's something I've never done before, but then again, that's we all can say that. Uh, we've, we've all been forced to be adaptable and, and try new things and, and meet new challenges as we've been through COVID. And um, certainly I wish that we all could be together in person. Uh, I think we probably all would enjoy that very much, and hopefully that can occur in the coming months as we get into 2021. But nevertheless, this is where we are, and we're thankful for technology that we do have this opportunity. Um, and I very much appreciate the opportunity to participate in this conference either way. And um, I get to talk about one of my favorite topics, and that's beef consumers and, and the beef business. And I think it's a, it's a very exciting story that we have to tell uh, as we look at the industry and, and, and look around in terms of the business and the opportunities that lay ahead. With that, it's very easy to get caught up in, in all of the noise of COVID and, and some of the volatility that's happened in the markets and some of the uncertainty. But ultimately, as we sort of step back and take the broader picture, I think we'll see some very important long-term trends. And, and most importantly, as we begin to look back, uh, we have the opportunity to learn from what we did incorrectly and learn from those lessons and, and hopefully, right, never repeat it again. And, and um, I think it's very important that we take some time to just sort of remind ourselves um, where this industry has come from. Consumers are, are complicated. And I think getting more complicated all the time, and we'll we'll talk about that in a little more detail uh, in in just a few minutes. But you know, all of us uh, probably have these general demands, and ultimately, whenever we go to purchase any type of product, whatever it is, you know, we we want to, our problem solved, and and we don't want to make have to make a lot of complicated decisions. Um, and, and with beef, it, it's a it's a kind of a multi-variable equation in terms of what are we looking for when we make a purchase of a beef product versus a poultry or pork product, and and you know a couple of things are important, and again we'll talk about these in more detail in just a little bit, but health, convenience, quality, and or taste and consistency, and then ultimately you know really our decisions are made upon a price value. Uh, type of comparison, and, and so we just kind of need to keep that in mind. Um, as, as we look back, though, in, in terms of the National Beef Quality Audits, uh, that the first one done in 1991, and, and then we followed up about every five years um, since then, and, and um, we'll look at some of the later ones in just a little bit, but you know, if you look very early, starting in 1990 and, and through that first decade, well, we had a lot of problems in terms of quality. Um, and that's important, right? Because ultimately, palatability was beef's primary advantage in the marketplace. And if we were failing at that, uh, consumers are not going to respond very for, uh, favorably, and, and um, it's ultimately that advantage that allows beef to demand a higher price in the marketplace. And, and so really we were finding out that we were struggling with our primary advantage, and again, as that price value relationship comes into play and come into mind, um, that's concerning. And then at the same time, we had lots of uh, health types of issues that were occurring as, as the McGovern, um, uh, recommendations were coming into play and getting uh, uh, lots of traction in the media, and some of those we still fight. Um, and then also in terms of convenience, where we had about half of the women uh, out in the workplace, and, and um, so you had a lot of two-income homes, and, and time became very, very important. And we struggled uh, in, in all of those things. And
and ultimately that that showed up very clearly in terms of spending and and this slide here shows um what happened between 1980 and 1998 and, and 98 is the important year because that's when uh beef demand ultimately sort of hit its low watermark or bottomed out but um in that 18 almost nearly 20 years uh, pork and poultry combined to get about 106, almost 110 dollars in new spending. Meanwhile, beef got six. In other words, there was a difference in terms of new dollars per consumer coming into those industries, respectively, in terms of 100 dollars. Now, that's very important because every business always looks for top line growth, revenue growth. And if you don't have that, then there's no opportunities, no new opportunities ultimately to grow your business. And that becomes very, very limiting. And so this is where we found ourselves in terms of the challenge and ultimately really struggling uh, with the competition. And again, as I mentioned earlier, one of those challenges really revolved around beef quality. But we've we've done a lot of work since and 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 um, really improved on that. But why is beef? Quality important. Well, one of my major professors at at Colorado State um, did some very critical work uh, in 2011 and uh, just putting together um, some data in terms of consumer response and, and how was the positive experience and, and the rate of that. And, and you can see that moderately abundant, slightly abundant, those are um, quality grade or marbling scores for the prime quality grade. Almost, you know, let's just call it 100% favorable. Uh, moderate and modest, that would be top choice. You, you know, you can see the difference there, 88% and 82% uh, positive sensory experience. And, and then small would be a commodity choice, and then we get down into some lower quality grades. But you can see, obviously, as we increase marbling, it is favorably related to a positive eating experience. And by the way, that also really revolves around consistency, too. And so quality grade is incredibly important and, and our industry has made huge advances in terms of improving uh, the quality grade in the slaughter mix and so this is just um, sort of the weekly improvement and you can see as, as you look back in, in January of 2007 um, we, we began kind of a steady march upwards in terms of the number of cattle grading choice. And, and we've now surpassed 70% where we were really sort of revolving around about a 50% um, choice mix uh, on a weekly basis. What's really incredible here is what's happened just in the last few years though on the prime side. So you'll notice that choice has sort of flattened out, but the continual improvement in quality grade has happened over on the prime side. So we continue to just keep ratcheting up uh, the genetic potential for marbling in these cattle, and, and we've almost tripled the number of cattle grading prime just in the last three years. And that ascent, you can see, is very steep. Uh, by the way, we just uh, eclipsed a new record uh, just uh, this last week, uh, first week in December, uh, in terms of the number of cattle grading choice and prime combined. And so this this continues. And, and uh, this is really a very, very important trend and makes a huge difference in our business. What's interesting is that uh, the premium for the prime carcass over on the wholesale side has maintained, has been relatively strong even through that increased volume. Typically, you would think that greater quantity would mean that the, the, the premium would decline and um, right anytime we do more of something that typically prices go down, but that's not happened. And, and um, 
Overall, the average is about $38 over the last 10 years. That's about a $340 premium in a carcass, a prime carcass versus a select carcass. Um, and we're about steady with exactly where we were 10 years ago. Uh, and, and with uh, three times the growth or three times the volume. Um, and so really just an amazing story that tells you that the market continues to want higher end product and, and um, we can continue to move this product. And, and so ultimately that kind of uh, price signal gets passed on you know, to the live side and you can see these grids adjusting and continually ratcheting up and, and the quality grade uh, minimum uh, becomes uh, even more important as, as we move forward. I think what's really interesting is what's happened in our business. And, and this is um, just a, a chart that outlines the boxed load count on an annual basis, except for through 2020, it's just through November, but the trend remains in place um, either way. And I think a couple of things are important. If you see the number of uh, the, the load count over on the select side, clearly that's gone down. We've made more cattle grade choice and or prime. As a result, the amount of cattle in the quality mix grading select has declined and therefore there's just not as much product to move on that side. Similarly, we've seen that kind of on the commodity choice because we continue to ratchet it up and we get more product in the upper choice and much of that gets into the branded lines. Um, but notice the difference uh, here in terms of the total loads of prime. Uh, in 2010, it was uh, 2,968 loads of, of prime that got sold. In 2020, just through November, it's uh, 10,766. So again, more than three times the amount. Um, but if you look at the spot market in the terms of the percentage of trades, that is prime that gets traded or, or a carcass that gets traded you know, with a 14-day delivery. Um, clearly, that number is very small in the prime market in the smallest, and it's actually gone down over time. So in other words, as we've increased the amount of product, but we're selling even less of it as a percentage out in the spot market, which tells you that both um, the packer and also the purchasers on the other side, you know, retailers and or restaurants are wanting to commit to outfront pricing and want some stability in that pricing and a promise of delivery uh, of that product. And, and so that becomes very interesting in terms of just generating overall business. And ultimately it says that they don't want to be in the spot market for a very high end product. They want to ensure delivery and want to ensure some kind of contractual agreement and, and price that much further out than just in a spot sort of an arrangement. And so this, this whole discussion around uh, uh, quality grade really has paid off. So as we talked about the difference between 1980 and 1998, now look at the difference as we talk about those trends between 1999 and most recently, uh, 2019, you can see that beef has begun to close the gap in terms of new spending with pork and poultry, where the difference was 100, it's now 75. And so we've gained ground um, and, and are, you know, chasing at the heels of our competitors um, and, you know, not only keeping even, but closing the gap. And, and ultimately, the, what, what's the primary difference? That really comes down to quality. And, and so we've we've made beef uh, stand alone in the marketplace. We've decommoditized it, um, and really made a huge difference for our industry. And, and I think tells a very important message about where we need to go going forward. Also, and so ultimately, I, I like to say that uh, beef quality has been a game changer. Uh, we've done 20 years of work in, in terms of better quality and better consistency. And, and what's interesting is that really helped anchor spending 
through the financial crisis. Uh, at a time, if we all think back to 2008, 2009, um, when we all thought that beef was really going to fall off and, and we were going to be very challenged because of price competitiveness, again, that price value relationship compared to pork or poultry, uh, beef would be disadvantaged. But in fact, it wasn't. And, and consumers continued to choose beef and continued to prove that they were willing to pay for beef. And what's interesting is we're seeing the same thing through COVID, that uh, consumers really want beef and want very high quality product. And, and um, there's a couple of reasons why that's important. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. But, um, you, you know, we've not seen any slowdown in beef spending here just in, in uh, the, the recent months. I think the other side of all of this is, is um, the story. So we always talk about quality and then story and what's going on in terms of the future. Um, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, market segmentation and, and consumers are very complex. And you know, there's any number of drivers that um, probably drive consumers to make purchasing decisions and, and um, that doesn't always seem to make sense. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is from Frank Burskins, who's worked uh, very actively in, in the food business. And, and uh, you know, he said that oftentimes, right, to, that we have a portfolio of priorities when we go through the, the, the checking line at the grocery store, right? And it's, it's cookies and vegetables. Uh, so, again, it, it doesn't always make sense. And that gets even further complicated as we talk about restaurant versus retail. But you know, consumers have lots of needs and lots of desires, but one of the things that we see as you look down towards the bottom of that list that becomes more and more important is, is the animal welfare and social aspects and, and or uh, the, the product story. And so I, I think um, we saw that really began to uh, come into play in the early 2000s. Um, and then as we came out of the um, recession and the financial crisis, that became even more important. And, um, you know, we, we saw that ultimately the, the quote that really resonates here in, in the power of the post-recession consumer is that they are increasingly taking care to purchase goods and services from sellers that meet their standards and reflect their values, whatever that means. Uh, that can mean a lot of different things, but ultimately it's that product story that becomes more and more important uh, as we talk about beef consumers. And, and we saw that um, with the National Beef Quality Audit, right? And, you know, we talked about the first three of those as we talked about quality, but then you begin to see something new come in to the industry that we hadn't seen before, and that's the issue of traceability. And then we began to kind of rephrase that with story and how and where cattle were raised. And so that ultimately becomes much, much more important as, as we drive forward and try to communicate with consumers. And, and probably the, the best data that I've seen of, of late comes from the Power of Meat study um, that this is done uh, regularly. And um, But the 2020 results really were very striking to me. And so top, uh, topics that shoppers want to hear about from meat and poultry brands and grocery stores, um, clearly nutrition, food safety practices are at the top of the list. But then begin to notice, look at what comes next. Almost half interested in animal care practices, 40% interested in the environmental impact. Then it becomes some um, concern about worker welfare and safety. And my guess is that number will even change as we come through COVID and um, we, we look at these in a year from now. And then initiatives to give back to community. I don't think those sorts of concerns were very prevalent uh, 20 years ago. And so we need to be very aware of that. To, com to compound all of that, um, if you begin to ask consumers about uh, the question, for example, ranchers take measures to minimize impact on animal farming 
uh, on the environment. And the percentage that say yes or no, and all shoppers, 40% say yes, 22% say no. What's most important, I think, in this particular survey and the results that happen, um, if you look at uh, the boomers or the Gen Xs, um, I'm a Gen X person, right? Uh, um, you, you know, nearly 40% that matches up with overall shoppers. 40% uh, say yes, and, and then, you know, 18% say, nah, probably not. They need to do more. But then fast forward uh, over to the Gen Z, 18 to 23-year-olds. The negative response is nearly double that of the boomers. And those are the ultimately the consumers that we have to meet their demand going forward. And so the point being, as we get into younger consumers and as they get more purchasing power and we look out into the future, it tells us that we have to do more to communicate our story and what we're doing correctly to them to kind of win them over. Um, you see almost the exact same trend in terms of animal welfare. Uh, Animal welfare for livestock raised in the U.S. is good or sufficient or satisfactory. Again, favorable out rates or is, is higher than unfavorable, but it's the age trend that uh, comes into play. And by the way, I think it's also important to note that the overall agreement, you know, those consumers saying yes, was 43% in 2020, that's down from 51% in 2019. So again, we have work to do um, in terms of telling our story, but that also says there's opportunity out there as, as we talk about. So with all of that in mind in terms of beef quality and, and the importance that, that it makes in terms of the business and, and those issues that we talk about in terms of spot versus outfront pricing and also maintaining traceability and or the, the, the importance of story uh, really emphasizes the importance of the value chain uh, as, as we go. forward and, and um, you know I think um, traditionally we worked you know if you look at that time period between 1980 and 1998 you know we really had a commodity orientation um, as very product you know just it was there because it was cheap and or available and we whatever we could do to make it that way and, and I think we learned our lesson um, that that didn't work very well and so increasingly we're moving more towards a solution or an end product orientation. Um, what's on the plate and then why is it on the plate? Why are, why are you making that purchase? And, and, you know, there's always this sort of base requirement that it, it has to be, uh, it has to taste good, it has to be consistent, and, and it has to be high quality. But then also the requirements of today really are more revolved around that, that solution or end product orientation that, animal welfare, environmental concerns, all of those things become much, much more important. And that ultimately is talking about that's a value chain orientation in, in every portion of the value chain working together versus just sort of an adversarial commodity mindset. And, and, and ultimately that really requires sort of customer-centric thinking, and, and you have to reverse the traditional chain um, instead of kind of, you know, just jamming it down the line and not being responsive to consumers. We have to kind of work bottom up, start with the consumer, and then adapt the value chain around quality, consistency, efficiency, volume, and then I would add story to that also. Very important as we go forward. Um, I think it's important, again, that we, we take the long view, right? To, and I love this quote from Scott Sagan at Stanford University, things that have never happened before happen all the time. There's always going to be uncertainty. There's always going to be things that disrupt our market and, and what have you. But, um, you know, if we take the long view and look at what 
consumers have been telling us for the last 20 years, quality and story are important. You know, we're going to be okay. And, and um, I think of nothing else, we've learned that through COVID. Consumers have been very responsive to purchasing beef. Um, it's enabled them actually to eat more high quality beef at home than they would have otherwise because the uh, restaurant um, business hasn't been able to kind of swallow a lot of that up. And they have sort of learned that they, and you see this and hear this, that they like high quality beef and they're committed to uh, com uh, preparing that at home and, and want to stay with that. And so all of these trends are probably going to be reinforced even more so going forward, not less. And COVID has, has really sort of sped all of that up. And, and, you know, I have a picture here of a green egg, but um, one of the things that was interesting is uh, several months ago, I, I was over at our local green egg dealer and he said that was telling me that they've sold more than they've ever sold before. Uh, and and uh, they couldn't get them in stock, right? And, and so people are making commitments and making investment into cooking at home and want to do that very well. And so I think these trends will stay well. So ultimately, one of my favorite quotes and, and I think basic principles of success uh, comes from one of my favorite business books of all time, and it's called Built to Last by Jim Collins. Uh, many of you might know him uh, from as the author of Good to Great, but um, you know he talks a lot about preserving the core and stimulating progress. And so, if a company or an industry is to meet the challenge of a changing world, and the world is always changing, it must be prepared to change everything about itself, except its basic beliefs. Uh, and so the only sacred cow in an organization should be its basic philosophy of doing business. And I would say that ultimately is honesty and trust and what have you. Um, but whatever it is that we want to do to maintain our consumers and be successful, we have to be willing to change. And, and um, I think, you know, keeping that consumer focus is, is very important. And as we've seen some discussion here in recent months about um, – sort of how the market operates and how our business operates. Well, it's important to remember that we were not very successful when we didn't focus on the consumer. And so uh, we, we really need to keep that uh, going forward. And that may mean that business looks differently than it did 20 years ago or 30 years ago or even 10 years ago. But that's how we ultimately create an industry that's built to last. And so with that, um, again, I want to say thank you. I very much appreciate the opportunity to be a part of this. And um, I look forward to being with you on January 12th and, and answering any questions uh, that we might have. Well, uh, Dr. Spears, thank you very much for that. And um, this, this question came in and... and um, Again, it may be uh, answered by you as well as some of our other uh, uh, presenters. But the the statement was made that the chicken and poultry, uh, sorry, the chicken and the pork industry have really done an excellent job of developing consumer friendly products, even though they're harvesting larger animals. That makes it more of a challenge. Is there any research being done to develop consumer friendly beef products? Some of the issue is how do you make a steak that can be prepared in a four to eight ounce serving size without making it very thin and hard to cook medium to, to rare? Uh, we're, we're seeing larger animals at harvest and often with larger animals that makes uh, the, the longissimus muscle larger, which means our ribeyes and, and steak sizes become larger. Uh, any research that you know of ongoing and um, uh, Sean, if you want to chime in on this too, after Dr. Spear with regards to NCBA work. I actually was going to say that question probably is best suited for Sean and given all the, the research that's going on that's supported by the beef board. Yeah, yeah, happy to answer that. So, you know, from our perspective, I think we have programs that focus on that. So we have a supply chain team that uh, Steve Wald, many of you may have 
seen him over the years. He's been here a while, kind of lead up. And a lot of our relationships or what we're doing with our beef promotional dollars are developing those relationships with people innovating and creating those ideas. So we are not necessarily doing them in-house. We are working with people uh, to understand and test some of those ideas. Um, but I know they, they are prevalent. And I know, you know, six to seven years ago, uh, beef as value, you know, getting those cuts was, was a big deal and a focus when we were going back, you know, so back, even going back to 2008, really, when we had some of those pricing concerns. Uh, so definitely a focus of some of our programming here and our relationship building with our supply chain audiences. Uh, Dr. Spear, there's a question that came in that uh, um, talks a little bit about uh, some of the data that you mentioned and um, the, the home consumers, are, are they purchasing um, kind of that higher end uh, kind of a product or because of restricted maybe financial means due to COVID, are they focusing more on lower quality grades? Um, are they being careful with their food dollars and are they maybe willing to spend money on higher quality beef or higher luxury type shifting away from poultry to buying steaks now and then? Yeah, and I, I think uh, it's a great question. Sean sort of addressed that earlier. We've seen um, pretty active spending on the beef side and, and consumers willing to spend up into those higher quality grades. And, and again, as I mentioned in the presentation, it's really the first time they've had access to high quality grade beef that maybe would have gone into restaurant or food service business. Um, and yeah, they've been, they've been willing to kind of spend up and do it. And, and um, I think that's probably a pretty important trend um, where you might see retail business kind of fighting for that type of product versus uh, the restaurant business or food service going forward. And certainly some of the work that I do with where food comes from, we're hearing that from retailers all the time. Um, they've recognized this trend and, and they want to get uh, access to that product in the future. Another question that came in from uh, our good friend, uh, Warren Beeler, <laughs> does having more USDA choice and prime product make our beef more attractive to export? Does uh, higher quality meat to provide us more opportunities for export markets? No question. I think that's one of those things that's really helped underpin growing export markets over time. That, you know, that's, that's just something we've consistently grown. Um, and, you know, it, it, it really is the area that no one else can compete with us globally. We produce a high quality product and, and it's why people come to the United States uh, to buy beef. And, and this is a question again on consumers and um, uh, Sean, you can be ready to, to chime in here too. Is there data relative to consumers increased desire to, to purchase local processed beef as opposed to remotely processed beef? And by that, I think they mean more of the uh, commodity beef. And, and do you anticipate this to change with time? Yes, Sean, I'll turn that over to you. I don't have a good feel for that specifically. Yeah, you know, and I think, you know, I mentioned it a little bit, but I think this is something we want to investigate more. It's, we've heard, again, a lot of rumblings around this, especially with COVID, um, the interest in people doing it. Um, so I don't have that data. We know most of the data, you know, if you, even previously, when you look at things like grass-fed and organic and antibiotic, and you throw everything in there, it's less than 4% of the market share that we have. So I'm thinking it's a small portion of what we're seeing coming through. Now, does that have a growing impact? You know, from focus groups and work that we do, we hear it. I think local adds some of that credibility for consumers. Now, whether they do or they don't, they feel like they can just pick up the phone or email the farmer or rancher if they have an issue with what's going on. So it does add a little layer of credibility for consumers. But again, you know, you, you go back to um, what Mr. Spear said, a lot of taste and your value drivers and convenience drivers. Those are the things really driving most people's everyday decisions. So that margin and when those prices get higher and then that convenience aspect of going to get it, I think that's it's going to hold it back a little bit from your commodity beef.
Dr. Carr, we had a question that came in for you. Do you get any uh, inquiries regarding kosher beef? Some, uh, some. The um, we've had, uh, yeah, we we've had uh, we have two facilities here uh, in our state that, that generate some kosher and halal product. Yes, we do. The, and perhaps uh, we should define what kosher is. Sure. Uh, so, so kosher would be uh, beef cattle that would be slaughtered under rabbinical law. So there's, um, I think sometimes folks think that uh, they are exempt, that they, those cattle are exempted from the Humane Slaughter Act, but, but that's not right. Uh, it, or they, they just don't have to be rendered insensible to pain. And, uh, and so the, uh, but kosher slaughter can be done and, and it can be done well. Uh, we got to do a good job with head restraint. Um, but um, yeah, so that, that's obviously associated with the Jewish faith. And uh, we'd be selling products only out of the four quarter um, for uh, associated with kosher products. Thank but lots you. of uh, a lot of the product that will uh, go to a kosher facility or facility that's kind of specializing in some kosher product. That'll be some really high quality beef a lot of times. Dr. Jones, I think it's time for us to start getting them to think about uh, some questions uh, for each of them to answer. You have some uh, there ready to go? Yep, I'd like to ask Dr. Carr to come. It, it relates to a question you just asked a second ago. Uh, Dr. Carr, we talked about the local thing, and in your presentation, you talked about losing the value off, all that sort of thing. Talk about pricing of that product, and you know, sometimes I'm afraid we, some of our producers who are selling locally may be losing money and not realize it, so please, please address the economic issue of selling local and how much we're losing when we custom process and don't get that value. Well, there, um, so I mean, you, we have to have a, a base value to think about what this calf is worth today. And then whoever the facility is that's going to process for you, let's say that that's going to be, I don't know, a $75 slaughter charge. And then let's say you're 75 cents a pound or something like that uh, when you talk about your cut and wrap fee. So if we have a, I don't know, 1400 pound steer that's worth uh, whatever, $1,800, and then he generates a 900 pound carcass and we put the $75 processing fee and then we're at whatever, 75 cents a pound. Um, we're, we've added an additional $800 in right there just to kind of get to our, our break even as to we come back to what we have there uh, for the value of that calf. So um, it can be done and I mean, it's, I mean, it's math. Uh, we can figure out what our break-even cost is going to be on that, but we probably need to be at, you know, probably a 25, uh, we need to account for some profit, hopefully, in there um, to merchandise that product. So that, um, yeah, if we're, if we're selling across the board at, uh, you know, um, $3 a pound at uh, selling it piece by piece out of the freezer on average, we're probably not winning. Um, so, yeah, there, but I mean, that calculation, I could have done that as we went through there, but uh, we kind of roughed it out a little bit there. Dr. Spear, you, you showed uh, at the end there the, the green eggs, and um, mm -hmm. uh, I happened to, to, to get its competitor as a Christmas gift, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm I've been amazed at the communities that have been developed over social media around this home cooking movement, the food shows that are out there. Watching uh, one of the ball games or, or in between ball games this weekend, I seen our um, uh, checkoff dollars at work talking about where to go find beef recipes on the website. Um, how do we continue to uh, reach out? Um, and this is something that all of you can address, but. How do we continue to reach out to hold on to these uh, consumers and, and new quote unquote foodies that uh, are, are coming in and buying our product? Do you feel like there's a, a general way that we can improve to keep that market share? 
Well, I, I think it, first of all, I think it's a really exciting trend because, you, you know, you hear people just like you, you're, you're, you've been out there, you've done the research, you're finding people, you're starting to talk to your neighbors, what have you about this. And, and uh, there really is sort of a renewed energy for, for home cooking, if you will. And, you know, when you do it at home, you want to do it well, right? It, it, there's, there's a great sense of pride that we all take. Um, to me, it's really a, an incredible avenue because we now have a captive audience. And for example, that this is precisely why we've created the beef checkoff, right? I mean, it, it's a it's a classic way to get in, and, and social media is one of the, the the prime avenues to be able to advertise or promote to them. And so, I, I think that's really exciting. Sean, do you have yeah. any other? I would just build on that. I, I mean, I think it's an exciting time. And, and the other thing you have is these long, you know, a lot of people can't go out right now or still are not comfortable going out right now. So it's a prime opportunity to take advantage um, and educate because consumers are looking for meal ideas to keep, Yeah. Uh, you know, they have ground beef in the freezer, they have steaks in their freezer. So how can we continue to remind them and keep beef top of mind? And it's things that we're constantly looking to do. You know, we saw a lot of things on the comfort meals increasing on the beef it's what's for dinner website we saw things uh, you know on just at, at first it was chef inspired meals and then I think people were like well you know that was fun for a month and a half but now I need quick and easy meals and then I think now you're seeing they kind of want that mixed up uh, you know one of the other things we're doing is with the, the boom in e-commerce e uh, we are running and having partners with you know people while they're shopping and it serves them up a recipe and all they have to do is click on the recipe and it puts all the ingredients in their cart for them. Uh, so they have that readily available. So with the technology, it just makes it a really easy match. Dr. Spear, can we, can we change gears here just a little bit and let you take a set? We're, we have cow calf producers on the program and what cow calf producers are interested in, they want to know how to increase value for their genetics for their health programs, for their management programs. So how do we validate and try to reach these young consumers and those kind of things? Can you go into that a little bit for us? Well, I, uh, you know, more and more we're seeing, we're hearing, we're watching, we're participating in what I would talk about is, is value chain alignment. Um, some people, sort of want to confuse that with vertical integration. It's not integration because it's not a packer owning all the cattle all the way through and what have you. I just don't see that happening in our business. But increasingly you're seeing systems sort of line up and, and where feeder cattle are going to be pooled and sold and managed and, and then sold to specific kinds of specifications that are probably going to go to you know a purchaser and there's going to be some sort of contract um, along the way and, and um, I think that involves both genetics it certainly involves uh, some health protocols along the way and then um, working with some systems that actually you're talking about providing a, an incentive or a dividend check back on the other side of it you know in, in um, so, uh, you, I, and a lot of that, again, let's, let's just go back to this conversation and the, the question that Jeff, you had just a minute ago. I think part of what's really exciting is, is we talk about people shopping at home. You now all of a sudden have these retailers saying, we want to participate with these customers and we want them to be captive to us, right? The, the, the biggest challenge to a retail chain is, is they want repeat shoppers. They want you to be very loyal. And how, how do you create loyalty? It's generally around the fresh side. And it's, you know, it's produce and it's meat. And then how do we differentiate? And so the product's got to be really good and it's got to have the right story. And all of that takes to your question, Dr. Jones, that takes some coordination. And, and, um, but there's real opportunity there if you're willing to give up I think some independence and willing to work with other people, um, really that's, that's how you create longevity. There was a question that came in and um, 
it, it kind of follows up on that. And it says, I follow several foodie groups and see many conversations mm. around pasture raised and finished beef. Most of these think pasture is healthier. And I've had conversations with people who think that farmers who grain finish feed their cattle stuff, which they don't understand what they're actually feeding and what that stuff is, um, is NCBA or other groups helping to try and educate consumers and understand the differences between uh, grain finished and grass fed beef. And so uh, I think that can be addressed by um, all three of you really, it's just not NCBA, um, but um, what, what efforts are being made to educate consumers about our beef products that are out there that are differentiated from one another? I mean, I can start. There's a lot uh, going on. And I think, you know, going back into the presentation, I think one of our biggest hurdles is consumers do not know how food is raised. So they're further removed from their food than they've ever been. And they're influencing, influenced by marketing. So when they see products side by side, whether it's grass fed versus grain fed versus no antibiotics, organic, whatever that might be, they're going to assume uh, you know, again, I heard it earlier, the word story is great. They want a story behind their product. So they're going to assume that there's something more in line because they have these adjectives and these quality indicators. And sometimes that could be grade and ch choice and those type of things as well. Uh, but that's a lot of what is going into it. But yes, the, so from that standpoint, we've had several programs about once a year, we're launching new programs to help educate consumers last year. And what the focus of this presentation was on the beef quality assurance. Uh, we have created a lot of infographic material to help understand what the actual differences are and have promoted that as well, whether it's grass fed, grain fed, organic. Um, this year, you know, there will be, will be some sustainability uh, factors coming out from the beef checkoff as well in terms of the consumer promotion. So it's definitely something that's top of mind. We have resources available as the conversation comes up for sure. I, I think too, uh, there, there's opportunity and, and we're starting to see some of this happen, you know, largely again, because of COVID, customers are coming into the retail store asking more questions. Retail chains are starting to realize we really need to train our people that are in the stores better. And there is some real efforts in these larger retail chains to get people trained. And, and you, you know, by the way, probably the company that's best at that is Whole Foods. I mean, they're, each department manager knows a lot about the product, but we're gonna see that probably replicated in other kind of more traditional retail chains in, in um, where they're, those people are being going to be able to answer questions and create the answers, uh, you know, in terms of differentiation. There's just a last comment that um, NCBA should continue to uh, try to get information out to the groups and, and use social media and uh, other magazines like Bon Appetit and et cetera to try and help educate. And uh, I think we all, uh, as partners in the industry as a whole, need to, to take on a little bit of that responsibility and uh, do, our, do our role in educating consumers as well. John, I, I have a question. With uh, uh, Beef Board Dollars, how, what percentage of, uh, of the budget is headed toward social media influencers, mommy bloggers, that kind of group. I know our uh, beef council here in our state, they've, it's been a few years ago, but Ashley Hughes, she really did some good stuff in my estimation with bringing uh, social media influencers. We put on programs for about 35 folks, to Meat Lab, and uh, we took them to the beef teaching unit. We took them to Quincy's and showed them a feed yard and we showed them a beef carcass and and uh, here's a, you know, here's a top butt and here's a chuck roll and here's ground beef. And, you know, they didn't know it, but it was, it, they were like, man, this is great. And uh, then they take and they blog about it and, and it got legs. Yeah. You know, thanks for asking. I don't have like a percentage on me. I'd have to go uh, actually look that up, but I can tell you it's a dedicated program for us. We have four or five staff members just dedicated to the influencer realm on its own. 
and promote uh, production is a big aspect of that. You know, there's a lot of things. Nutrition, obviously, is a big focal point in that influencer realm as well with dietitians and so on. Uh, but it's a large program for us here at the Beef Checkoff, uh, NCBA for the Beef Checkoff. So absolutely. Well, tonight, we, uh, we would appreciate the questions. We really appreciate our three panelists tonight, our three, three presenters. You've done a very excellent job and addressed a lot of issues I know our producers are very interested in. I think we probably need to kind of wind up now. Becky, can you come on? I think we have a drawing for $100. And if you would also mention something about the survey that participants will be getting from this. Yes, sir. Thank you all for staying with us this long. Our $100 winner this evening is Amy Cox. Amy, we will be reaching out to you via email tomorrow uh, to get your mailing address to get you your money. Um, also, um, at the conclusion later this week, we will be sending out a survey via email. We would appreciate all the feedback that you could give us. Um, our committee really looks at this information for future programming and speakers and the issues that you all as Kentucky cattlemen really want to dig in and address. So we would appreciate that. Thank you, Becky. And we wanna thank everyone for participating tonight. Once again, thanks to the three presenters. We appreciate your presentations very much and we may have some additional questions for you. Remember everyone, if you'd like to participate in the forage program, still time to register for the forage program, which will be held tomorrow evening. And that's always been a very important part of our Kentucky Cattlemen's Convention, forage at KCA. And so that will be held tomorrow evening. And once again, I want to reemphasize what Becky just told you. Anyone who has ideas or suggestions about future programs, we sure like to hear that. So, so please respond to us. Once again, thank you very much. And we'll conclude these presentations. Thank you.